Well, welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joshua Hoffman, as Sondra mentioned, and I am the head of product engineering for LeaseWeb. My talk today is the seven deadly sins of web scale engineering. And I think it's important that you know who you're talking or who's speaking to you. So I'll start out just a quick introduction of who I am. Uh, I actually grew up in Los Angeles and had dreams of being a movie director, which didn't work out at all. Uh, so I kind of fell back to my technical background. And the first company that I worked for was uh, in IT as a plastics company. And it's, it's actually, they changed their logo because PDU actually stands for Plastic Dress-Up Company, which I guess in the 50s when they started it made sense. Uh, but these guys invented trophies. And if you've got a trophy, you probably got some of their parts on it. I just love the fact that their modern logo today says availability because it really seems to fit with what we're talking about. But I have to confess to you that it actually means that all of their products are in stock and ready to ship. Uh, so some of you may have heard of Steinberg. It's a software company uh, from here in Germany, and that's where I went next. And we were f uh, fairly early. I worked in the US branch in having online operations. We really wanted to give our customers what they needed, and what they often needed were patches and upgrades, and mailing them floppies is a bit slow if you're stuck on a deadline. So that was when I really got my taste, uh, first start of setting up websites. And back then, we had an FTP server. Uh, and we even had a, a bulletin board for people that didn't have internet access, because of course, we're talking about the 90s. Uh, I really loved Linux, it made sense to me, and I just wanted to continue working with it, so I moved from there to a company called Guru Labs. And at Guru Labs, we worked with companies all around the world doing professional services and training in Linux, and really got to experience a wide variety of environments and able to see common problems. And in order really to stay focused on Linux, I thought, well, where could I go where I can really focus on Linux? And so from there, I joined Red Hat. And I spent about 10 years working at Red Hat off and on, which is uh, an amazing place to work if you want to just be completely surrounded and work with Linux stuff all the time. And then a funny thing happened. Around 2005, I got called in and was asked to work on this new virtualization thing. And I created Red Hat's virtualization curriculum, their certification program, and then followed on by building the virtual training platform that they still run today. And I'm really proud of that. We didn't know in 20, uh, 2007 when we launched it that it was a cloud product because we didn't have really that term yet, but it actually was. And it, it allowed multiple instances of the lab work that people were doing in the hands-on classroom to do over the internet in a cloud setup. Uh, so after about 10 years at Red Hat, I was looking for something new, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine. He said, you should come to Tumblr. And it was funny because just a week before, I had been looking at Tumblr's website and their little about page and had this cute little staff. They're all eating lunch together and just seemed like this fun little company. Uh, and so when he called, I said, yeah, that sounds great. I moved up to New York City, joined the team at Tumblr. And when I started, we were about 30 people. And when I left, uh, we were about 350 people. Uh, and of course, Yahoo came in, bought the company. That was a good time to look into something new. Uh, so just to give you an idea, my role at Tumblr was uh, originally just joining the engineering team as a system engineer because we were a very small group. Uh, and when I left, I was the technical director. We had built an entire data center, migrated the whole company out of managed hosting and into a better fit for their needs. Uh, when you hit you know, thousands and thousands of servers, something to think about or make sure you have the right managed hosting partner. Uh, I did a talk all about that stuff. Uh, if you look um, at previous Velocity talks, they're up on Vimeo. If you're curious, you can Google for it. After Tumblr and the old Yahoo acquisition, again, looking for something new, uh, I came to Berlin to join SoundCloud. And at SoundCloud, I uh, had a lot of fun there. I worked there for about three years. When I first joined SoundCloud, uh, it was really a very small, scrappy startup. We hadn't moved into that fancy factory building that you probably know about if you live here in Berlin. Uh, and we built all kinds of great infrastructure, really got things stable, scaled the engineering team. Uh, and now, I'm happy to say, I'm uh, head of product engineering at LeaseWeb. Again, working with a great engineering team and really working on bringing things to the next level, have the best stuff that we can offer for the latest generation of technologies. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you for indulging me. A little bit about this talk. So what is this? So I call these the sins. And since there are seven deadly sins, it makes sense to me to have seven engineering sins. Now, the interesting thing about this, uh, and I, I don't mean this to be at all religious, so I just think it's an interesting theme to use, but 
when you talk about sin, one of the things, if you look at you know, proselytizing, they say, before you can save a sinner, they have, you have to tell them how and why they are a sinner. Because until they accept that they are committing a sin, they won't change. And the interesting thing for me about what we do at WebScale is that when you start small, you have a great idea for a startup. You know exactly what you want to build. You create this beautiful new phone app, whatever it is. You basically can't do anything wrong. You know, if you can write a line of code in any language, there are so many tools out there now where you can just instantiate a database. Uh, you can use, you know, magic software like Active Record. Uh, you can do all these kind of things, and you can get that app working, and you can get it on the phone, and people will start using it. But if it's a cool app and people like it, and it gets really popular, all of a sudden now, where you could do anything before starts to change. And the things that you might not have known were important when you first started, which is very, very common. You know, most of the time when someone has an idea for an app, they start with that idea. They don't start with, well, I've been working in the industry 10 years and I really understand scale and now I'm going to build something. There are some companies like that, but that's rare. The new and exciting startups are usually people who are new to the scene. And so now you have to live with whatever it was, the mistakes you didn't know you were making. So I hope through this talk to share some real stories. So I'm going to tell, tell you seven case studies that are based on real events, but I have fictionalized them a little bit uh, just because it makes sense. So uh, let's get right into it. And the first case study, let's say that it comes from a company called Woohoo. Use your imagination. Uh, but it's a company that operates many, many data centers. And they, like most companies, uh, especially early on in the scene, create their own data center management platform because there's not a lot of software out there that really meets the needs of running a large internet application or set of applications on, on a large set of uh, hardware in a data center. And whenever you write software, some of your opinions are going to be embedded in the software. Uh, and an interesting thing happens. When it's time to build the second data center, the team that's brought in to do that says, well, we don't, there's some things we don't like about the current data center management platform. So at this point, you're at a fork in the road. You could enhance the current platform, or you can do what a lot of people do, is you can do what I call committing the sin of pride. And what do I mean by that? Refusal to use tools not invented here. So this team that is going to build the new data center, well, what they chose to do, instead of trying to enhance and fix the software they had, they said, well, well let's create a new data center management platform. We'll fix all the problems. We'll build it right this time. And then, of course, we'll migrate the old data center to the platform, and it'll be beautiful for everyone. Uh, and this can be refusal to use tools that your own company made in your department, or this could be refusal to use all of the wonderful open source software that's out there because as a developer, you just think you're going to do it better. Well, what do you think is the result in this particular case? We flash forward to current time. They now have eight data centers that run on eight different data center management platforms, which basically means, as far as I'm concerned, they learn nothing as they work through this problem of building the proper data center management platform. And as an engineer now, your job is more difficult because, of course, you want to build things that work across multiple data centers. So you have to code to multiple APIs. So on top of these eight different management platforms and APIs, there are multitudes of other software that people have built to abstract on top of them. And now, troubleshooting any particular team software can be quite challenging. Our next case study, and uh, the company that this comes from, well, uh, let's call it Pink Shoe Linux. I think you can kind of follow me there. Uh, if you're not familiar with DocBook, DocBook is a specification that is used for authoring material that might go on the web, might be published in printed form. You write the material in XML, 
And it gives you some advantages, like having a single source that generates your multiple outputs. And it also lets you do things like have an instructor version of a, of a course manual that has extra answers in it versus the student version that won't. Uh, and DocBook is a great tool for that. What's challenging about DocBook is that it's, it's the specification, but how you actually generate the output, there's different tools you might choose. Some people build their own. And the idea here was we were already mostly using uh, some DocBook features, a completely proprietary build system that needed to be maintained by people authoring, in this case, coursework. And so the decision was made to migrate to a more standard tool chain for DocBook. Uh, in this case, the tool that was chosen is actually a tool called Publican. And what this does is gives you the advantage of you're no longer maintaining your own tools, you're sharing with other people. If you believe in open source, this is generally viewed as a very good thing. And there were already resources within the organization supporting Publican. So we chose a promising engineer and said, hey, let's tool this thing up, set it up for us. Should be a very brief project, maybe a few weeks to get the tool chain working, to define the workflow, do a little documentation. Well, several weeks go by. And I start looking into the code to review things and got a couple of alarm bells when I saw something that looked kind of like this. And if, if you're not seeing it, the very top line there, this is supposed to be a project to implement a DocBook toolchain, and yet it seems like it's meant that it could function with or without DocBook. And in digging to the, into this further, I discovered that this engineer had really been thinking about publishing his whole life had fantasized about building his own superior system and took this project as an opportunity to do that. But in order to meet his actual requirements, of course, he would find a way to support DocBook. Uh, by the way, um, this is code I just stole off the web from an open source project. Anybody know what it is? If you do, see me later. I have a special prize for you. Um, but so what, what is this engineer doing? This I call the sin of envy or desire for a more exciting project. A lot of the work we do isn't glamorous, it isn't fun, but keeping it simple and effective is, to me, the right answer. Uh, or I look at it another way. There's a song from a guy named John Coltrane uh, called Code Monkey. If you know that song, one of the verses is, he says, I'm, you know, tell, tells my manager to go write the goddamn login page himself because he's tired of just writing login pages and wants to actually build something exciting. Um, this is challenging, right? You want to keep engineers happy. You want to give them exciting things to work on. As an engineer, I want to work on exciting things. But if you're really committed to the success of the company and building out everything you need to handle the load that you're going to face, you have to have discipline around this. So the result of this was a new bespoke publishing tool that replaced the old one. And Works with DocBook? Well, I said maybe not really, because although it mostly worked with DocBook, there was one critical feature that it broke. And this was the ability to export portable translation objects, which if you're not familiar with document publishing, what you do is you write it in the language you know, you export these objects, you send them to a translation company, they translate them, they send them back, you import them, and now you have multiple language versions of your document. Two weeks before the publishing deadline to get these objects to the translator, I was called in to fix the thing, and to my surprise, what I discovered was, and the way I tell the analogy is like this. Imagine if you had asked someone to create a desk lamp for you, and instead what they did is walked in your office with a giant killer robot that had a light bulb on top of its head. So needless to say, we were able to sort it out by basically throwing out most of it and just implementing the standard tool as it should have been originally as a two-week project and about four months of wasted work that went in the trash. It happens. So metrics collection. How many people here collect metrics on their network? Or something? Right, we want to be. We want that visibility. You don't want to be flying blind. If you set up a service and you have no idea what's happening, you don't know if it's working, you don't know when it's going to break, whatever. Well, in this case, we realized we didn't have good metrics on the network. And uh, if you're wondering the name of this company, by the way, this is a very accurate story. Um, we'll call them Hipster. Um, so at this company, we had grown really, really fast. 
I mean, in the time that I started, I remember first seeing the, the dip in the traffic that we had just from the front end. Uh, the peak had become the low point very quickly within my first year. So stuff was exploding, and we built really quickly. So then it was catch-up time to put in the network metrics. Well, the team just kind of said, hey, this is a great idea. Let's instrument anything, everything, and flip it on. And we were using an in-house metrics platform. Uh, if you're familiar with OpenTSDB, this was the heart of it. And so, of course, that runs on an HBase cluster. Uh, and when the network team, without telling anybody, just turned this on, we're talking about 2,000 network ports sending every frame to the TSDB cluster, which was already being used to monitor all the critical systems that were running the site. Well, <laughs> as you can imagine what happened next, the whole thing fell over because this is the sin of gluttony or ignoring scope and capacity. And I think there are many dimensions to capacity planning. First of all, how many people here uh, are an engineer or work in engineering? How many of you are responsible for capacity planning? I'm going to give you a hint. If you put your hand down, you are wrong. If you work in engineering, Everything you do requires capacity planning. And it requires an awareness because there is no unlimited resource. So for example, you might have a vendor and they're a CDN vendor and you're only running a portion of your traffic on that CDN and you're getting a better price that you just negotiated so you decide to swing all of your traffic to the new CDN vendor. Well, if you're gonna blow it up you know, 10, 20 times what you're doing, it's easy to naively assume that the CDN vendor will just handle that for you, right? They're a CDN, that's what they're supposed to do. But even this requires capacity planning. Because I can tell you from personal experience, if you do that to your CDN vendor, they will not like you, even though you're paying a metered rate and you're paying for everything you're using. Uh, and so you have to call them in advance and say, hey, we're getting ready to put nine petabytes of traffic on the CDN. Can you handle that? Are you ready? And then probably you, somebody, hey, guys, whatever, and you know, they scramble and they get it ready. And then your site doesn't go down. Uh, but it's absolutely in every way. So whether it's an internal resource that you're consuming or whether it is a vendor that you're using, you have to do capacity planning. I mean, even something like AWS or you know, if you're standing up EC2 instances, you can't just turn around and fire up a 1,000 instances and expect everything to go fine and, and there's no problem. You have to do capacity planning at every stage. So of course, as I mentioned, the, the sheer volume of new metrics uh, knocked it over, killing dashboard performance for everyone, which is fun when then you're having some kind of problem and the dashboard is so slow that it can't render anything. So this one is an interesting one. I'm going to say this is a company called Audio Garden. And if you're not familiar with what a timeline service is, when you log into a site like Facebook, like Tumblr, like any of these things, you have posts that you're following and you're seeing the new material coming up. And that has to be generated somewhere. Uh, and when you first start, if you're building your very first web application, you've never done this before, you don't have a service for this. You just do what we call the naive design. You write your PHP or your Rails app or whatever, and you have a database, and every time someone posts, you put it in the database, and then when someone logs in, you just say, oh, who's, who's, who are they following? Let's look up all the things that those people posted recently, and then let's display that to the user. Sounds simple, right? Well, obviously, to scale this, you need to decouple things to break it apart. And ultimately, when you hit a large enough scale, you will build a service just to do this. And you have to use some kind of caching model. You know, There's no way you can build it uh, just to be pure database queries. And actually, if you want to see a great example of how to do this kind of service at scale, uh, Instagram did a really cool talk about it last year. Uh, they tell the full architecture they use, how it works, really brilliant. Uh, but in this case, a very smart and talented engineer was tasked with building a replacement that could support the growth and scale that was anticipated. And this engineer went off in isolation and started working on it. And I mean, really smart guy. He's digging into all kinds of eventual consistency design patterns, uh, eventually produces a service that's built with two tiers, 
And it's a brilliant piece of software. It really handles the timeline service well. It uh, caches, it's performant, it's scalable, it's reliable in the right ways. But you know, there are always going to be compromises when you design anything. So what went wrong here? What, what sin are we talking about now? Well, you might wonder how this ties in. I'm going to call that premature optimization. Because if you work for six months in isolation on something, then what you're going to find, of course, is that perhaps the requirements have changed. Maybe what needs to be served to the user has additional elements you didn't consider. And in this particular case, by the time it went live, went through a challenging migration to get everything moved over to it, it was discovered that the requirements had changed. So again, brilliant engineer, brilliant piece of software, but it doesn't fit anymore because it was so optimized for the way the problem had been designed or scoped originally that by the time the situation had evolved, it just didn't fit anymore. So again, this is why we do Agile. This is why we stay in touch. And this is why we never try to optimize anything uh, until we know what we actually need to do. Now, if you still don't understand the notion of premature optimization, the way that I explain it is like this. Imagine you're a company and you're serving pistachios. I like to call this the pistachio thought exper experiment. Uh, and I, I supply you with a room, let's say this size, waist deep in pistachios that are not shelled. So they're in the shell. And what your customers want are just the nut from within the shell. They don't want the whole the shell. So you need to come up with a way to find pistachios, shell them, give the, the nut to the customer. And the additional challenge I'm going to give you is that we are going to use a naive storage system in that we're going to dispose of the shells within the same room. So every time you open one and take the nut out, you drop the shell in the room. Well, you can imagine the first year of operation or maybe the first month or whatever, there's no way you can screw this up. You got somebody waiting for a shelled pistachio. You can look everywhere. There are pistachios everywhere. Just grab some, shell them, hand them out. But as you start dropping the shells and the load shifts from everywhere around you are available resources to now you have to sift through these shells to find something that has not been shelled, a fresh nut that you can share, your technique has to change. And the longer time goes on, this problem gets worse and worse, and so you need more and more refined techniques. And at some point, you may come up with an incredibly complicated, laser-guided, you know, vision-capable robot that will dig through and find, maybe also using weight, the, the things that you need. But if it was day one again, and you have a line of customers at the door, and you're not ready to start sharing out the stuff until you've built that laser-guided, weight-detecting, computer vision robot, you're going to go out of business, even though you have an ample inventory and customers ready, because you are prematurely optimizing before you actually need any of that. So it's a way that I like to think about it, and a, a good thought exercise. What should be really simple? Removing a driver. So back to Hipster, we've got a fleet of about 1,000 servers right now at the time that this happened. And this is a true story that actually made the news, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, but basically, an engineer was tasked to unload IPMI drivers. And what we're talking about is if you have the management board in the server, there's a driver that you can load in Linux that will allow you to talk directly to the management board on some systems uh, rather than talking to its network interface. And what we discovered was that if you loaded this driver and sent some commands, there was a possibility that this driver, which had some kind of bug in it, could deadlock the system. But if you never loaded the driver, it was never an issue. And since we had no functionality that required communicating to the IPMI interface through the host OS, it seemed simple. First, step one, just push a config to all the servers to blacklist that driver so it'll never be loaded again. OK, that's easy enough, and that was completed successfully. The second step was to find all the servers where the driver was loaded and simply unload the driver. Not a big deal. About 1,000 servers. Shouldn't take too long. Uh, so what this engineer did was 
picked one server to test first, which you obviously should, right? We like testing. Tested it, worked flawlessly. Picked another server, tested it, worked flawlessly. Well, when he then decided two servers were sufficient to test, he kicked off a job on the entire fleet to go out to the machines and unload the driver. Well, what we didn't know was that his test servers were the unusual case. And the more common case was that when you tried to unload the driver, it triggered the bug that deadlocked the motherboard. Now, to add an additional complication, this, uh, this is not the exact model, but it's similar. And what I want to point out about this, all of the servers at the time that they were using were these type of four-in-one. So you actually have four servers in one 2U chassis that are sharing two power supplies. Now, we discovered that the only way to recover a system that is in this deadlock state was to power cycle it. But if you have four systems in this chassis and two of them are deadlocked, what do you do? Because if you remote power cycle it, you're going to also power cycle the two that are working, one of which might be a master database server. So at this point, panic starts to set in. Now, for those of us that, yeah, well, those of us in the, you know, in the operations center looking at dashboards, we're starting just to see machines dying left and right for no apparent reason. The person actually doing this was also working remotely. And so in the chat, uh, ops chat, we say, hey, I think I might have messed something up. <laughs> yeah, at this point, I made the call. I said, guys, we have to take the site read only because we don't know what's happening here, but it looks like it's blowing up all over everything. Uh, and fortunately, the damage was somewhat contained in that right around after the eight, uh, 800th server had deadlocked out of the uh, about 1,100 we had, the next one that died was the one that was actually doing the jobs, to sending the jobs to kill them. So <laughs> once that one deadlocked, then okay, no more damage was happening, but what do you do? You know, we had built a, so, a lot of data center automation, and so there were two or three technicians on staff that were working on various things. Well, I'll tell you what ended up having to happen was everybody that could piled into a car, drove to the data center as quickly as possible, which is about a 30 minute drive, and we spent the rest of the day going around, identifying the deadlocked servers, yanking them out to power cycle them out of their chassis and shoving them back in. Eight hours later, site was back online, no problem. <laughs> so, what is this? I call this the sin of wrath or insufficient testing. And in this case, I love this picture because it's, it's a real image, and I've seen you, many of us have seen these if you travel around a lot, but you can confidently say that this was probably not meant to display that. All right, so, of course, approximately 800 physical servers required a hands-on fix before the site is back online. Yeah, that was a fun day, let me tell you. All right, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because when I used to work there, of course, you screw up, it makes the news, and then I would get a phone call or an email from my father because he would have seen the news and, and rough day, huh? <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> no. uh, so next case study, an enterprise server management. So we're back to the Pink Shoe Linux company. Uh, and as part of their early effort to really deliver an enterprise platform, they create an online service to allow management of the software on your servers. Uh, we might call it the Pink Shoe Network. Uh, and this online service is really great. I mean, it really helps for people that have fleets of machines that want to manage them, want to control the software on them. Uh, really quite a nice platform in terms of what the customers received. And the guys who built it, the team there, uh, they built a bespoke CMS, which at the time was a reasonable thing to do, but the thing that made no sense to anyone was number one, they chose to use an existing database that was already deployed at the company. Okay, fine, well this happened to be Oracle. Whatever you think about Oracle, that's fine. Um, but they also, all over the code base, hard-coded Oracle database queries. Now, that's okay, right? Everything is working, but 
what's going to happen when a few years later, customers who like this platform so much say, can we get an on-premises version of this? And that's a very lucrative opportunity, but it's a difficult conversation when it starts with, do you have an Oracle license? <laughs> and they're like, no, we don't want Oracle. We want your product. Uh, so this, of course, I call the sin of greed, or making stuff tightly coupled or monolithic. And if I had to give one piece of advice to anyone creating a new application today that you think might be the next big thing, and of course you'd think that or you wouldn't be working on it, I hope, but maybe you're just doing it for yourself, whatever it is. Above all, if there's one sin you need to avoid, it is tightly coupling your data source to your application. Because as you scale things up, this is the one that will hurt you again and again. And depending on what mechanism you've chosen, <clears throat> active record, for example, uh, it may be doing things you can't find. And you cannot tease out and separate very easily the interactions with the data source and the application. And this is one of the things that becomes the number one challenge in taking something that worked well at a small scale and bringing it up to a very large web scale. In this particular case, years of work were needed to actually clean out and abstract away all of the Oracle database interactions before it was actually a clean and separate code base. And in the meantime, in order to satisfy customers, the company had to pay for Oracle licenses to ship with this thing for the big customers so they could take it on that didn't want to go anywhere near Oracle. All right. Should be easy. A simple gateway service. Well, what are we talking about here? Um, this is a company that I actually did a lot of consulting for, and you've all heard of it. It's been around forever. Um, but I'm going to say it's called Americans on the Internet. Or you could just abbreviate that to AOI. All right. Um, <laughs> so working and consulting with these folks uh, was a fascinating experience because what you're talking about there is a company that was such an early adopter that nothing we do today existed. Nothing. None of the protocols we've standardized, none of it. And so everything they built was proprietary. And when they originally started, the service was released on one computer, and it was called Stratus. Anybody heard of Stratus? So they make these giant computers that banks and hospitals use, and they're super parallel, super reliable. Everything's redundant. Uh, if a Stratus server has a problem, it actually calls the technician itself. So technician shows up at your data center. Hey, you, you got a bad hard drive in your server. I brought it in. It needs to be replaced. OK, great. OK, no downtime. They cost like half a million a piece, which is a little shitty for a unit of scale. Because if you can handle 5 million users on one Stratus, and then you have 5 million and two users, you now need to spend another half million. So the decision was made pretty early on, let's move to this Unix thing. Unix boxes are dropping in price, and there's this free version called Linux. Let's move all of this Stratus stuff onto these Linux machines. But of course, it's never that simple. So immediately, developers start building new stuff on Unix. And in order to make this easy, one of the old Stratus, you know, graybeard people that was there, whatever, builds this gateway service to broker the proprietary Stratus protocol to TCP IP so that all the new stuff that's being built can just talk to this gateway service. Well, as the time progresses, using HPUX also becomes not such a great unit of scale if you have to buy more HP boxes and licenses just to deploy this gateway service, which at the time, HPs were the cheaper alternative to Stratus, so it made sense. So the task was created, let's move this gateway service to Linux. We can use commodity hardware, it'll be great. Only no one can find the documentation or even the source code. So you here, you have this binary service that's pretty straightforward, but nobody knows exactly what it does or how it accomplishes what it does. I mean, we know what it produces when you talk to its API. And this, of course, is what I call the sin of sloth. Avoiding maintenance or documentation. 
And it was even better because the engineer in this case had left the company. And no one could find him. Because he was an early shareholder. And he retired to some other country where he had a big estate and was not interested in taking phone calls anymore. Uh, so what's the result of all this? Well, after months of work and mo multiple outage-causing failed attempts, finally, a working replacement was created with good documentation and source code. So I hope in these case studies that I've shared with you, you can find something to take away to inform the work that you do next. And when you're faced with a situation where you have to make some kind of engineering design, I like to think about quotes. I like quotes. And for me, this one, a problem is a chance for you to do your best. And so I'll leave you with that. Of course, we'll do some Q&A. Thank you. Right. Any questions for Joshua? Yes, no, yeah, there's yeah. one. Well, first of all, it was a great talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, I was interested a bit in the greed, talking about the greed and lust, um, premature optimization and tying to the database, because many times uh, it's very hard. You have an abstraction layer, and you get really like, active record, and you have really horrible performance, doesn't scale. Then you tie it directly to some data store with your caching mechanism. And maybe you have great performance, but you're completely optimized to one case. Um, so I think these two seem to be a bit um, a balance between these two points. There's no clear. So I don't know if you have anything you could say about um, how to actually manage that in a real case, uh, handling the data in an abstract way, but also having performance. So um, if I understand the question correctly, it's sort of we, we have this spectrum, right? Of you know, a pure data abstraction or some magic code that handles the data interactions for you? And, and how do you sort of find the, the answer, right? You want to rapidly develop, but you also want scalability? Yeah. Um, I think the, the best advice I would give if you're starting out, don't even worry about how to make your data source fast. Just find anything that works. But the critical point is do not have any of your application code rely on any aspect, attribute, or you know, feature of your data source. In other words, really start by building two applications. One that is your application that holds all its logic, that holds all its interface, um, you know, everything that, that actually involves code you're writing. And then write a really tiny service that just abstracts whatever you've chosen as your data source so that you can change what's behind it later. Now, you just want to give yourself that maximum flexibility so that you can Again, completely switch from one database provider to another, for example, or from a SQL technology to a NoSQL technology, or whatever makes sense. But keep it out of the application code. Don't rely on any magic, would be the best advice I could give. Any other questions? And, and by the way, uh, right back there. Yeah. Yeah, I got one. Uh, you have mentioned the premature optimization, but if we start to build a system for something, for requirements that we have today, by the time we finish building it, although the interval will be super short, Sorry, it means, uh, can you yes, uh, when we start to build system today, we have some requirements, but by the time we finish building the system and we are growing, our requirements changed. Do you have any guideline or your personal preference for what we should start building today, like 5x, 10x, 100x. Um, so sorry, I'm not quite, but you're talking about the, the, the problem of you start and by the time you finish, the requirements have changed? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. you don't want to redo the system every two months. Sorry? You don't want to redo the system every two months. Right, yeah. So, you know, you don't want to rebuild everything all the time. You want to kind of think of something that will work for you. So that's where, for me, I come back to that pistachio problem. I say, okay, well, What's a good horizon? And for me, one to two years is a good horizon to target. So when you're building a system that needs to fulfill your needs, meet your load requirements, whatever it is, um, there's a couple things, right? I mean, of course, we work agile so that we can be quick and adapt to changes as they come in for our requirements. But really, if you can figure out what your requirements are for the next two years, build something that works for that, build the simplest thing you can build that satisfies that, but leaves the flexibility 
to make changes. So you have nice, loosely coupled parts that any element could be swapped out. As you approach that horizon, you should be able to tell based on trends if you're still on track for two years of lifespan. And somewhere around a year to 18 months, you can start working on the replacement. And eventually, you will hone in on the architecture that's right for your platform, and you won't be rebuilding it over and over again. But I would say, you know, if you're really lucky and you have some application that starts small and then blows up huge, plan on rebuilding things two or three times. Because the solution that you need at very high web scale often can be a bad solution when you're at kind of low or medium scale. In other words, it requires things, you know, if I said to you, well, I can run the entire company's site on one server. The database, the web server, the application, everything can run on one server. But in order to implement a single instance of this service in a distributed fashion, we need 50 servers for cluster reliability and the way we want things to fail and so forth. You just create a ton of operational burden that you don't need. So I would say, don't run it on one server. Challenge yourself to run it on three servers, but only because it forces you to decouple some things and plan again for that one to two year lifespan of, okay, this will get us through the next two years, so in a year we can start thinking about replacements. Look at, we'll find the pieces that, that need to be replaced and the pieces that scale very well. Uh, and I look at it that way. So plan one to two years of lifespan. Eventually you will land on the architecture that serves all of your application needs and, and fits scale and can grow. Because uh, it's really hard, I mean, more and more in our industry, there's wonderful established design patterns. So watch a lot of talks, steal as much as you can, of course. Um, does that answer your question? Any other questions? And by the way, I'm happy to answer questions on uh, anything in my background, if anyone's interested in dirty secrets of the companies I've worked for. Cool, well, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the show. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much.